Today is Monday, July the 10th, 2017. The location is the Yankee Air Museum in Belleville, Michigan. The time is 11 a.m. The person being interviewed is Joseph Horiak. Joseph served in the United States Army Air Force during World War II. The interview will be conducted by Dan Mehal. Also present at this interview will be the videographer, Jerry Jessen. This interview is being conducted on behalf of the Oral History Project at the Yankee Air Museum in Belleville, Michigan. To start with, may I call you Joe? Sure. Okay. How are you today? Fine. And when were you born, Joe? April 2nd, 1924. Where were your parents born? My mother was born in Pennsylvania, and my dad was born in a small town in Hungary, in Europe. And when did he come over? 1920. And what did your father do for a living? Well, he was a coal miner for 18 years. And uh, then we moved to Detroit, and then he began working in uh, the factories during the war. And later on, he became a, a, a woodworking specialist, uh, repairing equipment. That was his uh, vocation in Europe. He was a, a cabinet maker. Okay. Do you remember what year your parents were married? Uh, no, not exactly. I would guess 1923. And, and where did you grow up? Uh, my first 17 years were in Pennsylvania, a small town called Winbur, seven miles uh, east of Johnstown. So that's um, south and east of Pittsburgh? Southeast of Pittsburgh, yes, about 70 miles. And did you go to school there then? I went to school there, uh, yeah. Uh, through high school or? At, after my third year, uh, during summer vacation is when I moved, I went up to Detroit and got myself a job. Okay. And that was when, uh, a, a year later, I took my dad up here and uh, got him a job. It was, it was Ford Motor Company. Okay. And then we moved the family up six months later. So you're, you're, was it your mother that gave you the money to move, to move up here? Yeah, she managed to save enough to, for a train fare to uh, Detroit. And did your mother work outside the home? No, but she did uh, work on the side. She was a seamstress, and she w would weave carpets for people and do odd jobs. Uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? I had two brothers and two sisters, They're all younger than me. What were your brothers' names? Uh, John, Bob, and my sister's names were Anna and Olga. And where, where did you get your first job when you came to Detroit? Where did you work? First two weeks was in a lumber company, making crates to uh, ship jeeps to Europe. <laughs> and where did you go from there? I went to uh, Cadillac and I worked in the Allison division uh, grinding crankshafts for the Allison engine. And after uh, about three months, I went to GM and I got a job working in the Argonaut building, which was right next to the GM building. And uh, we were making checking gauges uh, out of sheet metal for the manufacturers. So it's not really a tool and die job. It, it was. It wasn't quite that uh, ex extensive. It was a matter of uh, filing and drilling and sheet metal that made. Uh, I, I guess I don't know what they call it, gauges. I guess to uh, check contours and different things on the aircraft industry. Where did you live when you first came to Detroit? I lived, uh, I, it's hard to remember, but I think it was a YMCA, I think it was in Ham, uh, not Ham, uh, Highland Park. 
So you, you came up to Detroit in 1942 then, around, roundabouts? Yes. Okay. That must have been just after Pearl Harbor? Yes. Do you remember where, where you heard about Pearl Harbor, what you were doing? Uh, I was in school. It was my last year in school there. I, that I, it's the best I can remember of it. I can't. So how long after you got to Detroit was it before your parents came up? A year and a half. <clears throat> and then uh, were, you, were you drafted or did you enlist in the year? I was drafted. And um, GM wanted, wanted to defer you? Yeah, they wanted to keep me there. They tried to get a deferment for me and uh, I, in fact, I had to quit the job to keep from doing it. I took a part-time, well, it wasn't a part-time, it was a short-term job with Chrysler, just chasing stock, because uh, I, I, I had already gotten my uh, notice. Okay. So. Uh, and, and where did you report? Do you remember? Uh, Battle Creek. Battle Creek, yeah. And, and where did you take basic training? Well, from there I went to uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, and we, we, they gave us our clothes and other equipment, then we got on the train and we went to uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. So how did you end up in the Army Air Force then? Uh, I kept trying to get into cadets, and I, I would pass the examination, and uh, I was ready to go to school, and the uh, first time was in uh, Tennessee. And uh, one morning they called everybody out and said, everybody from A to H, fall out here, from H to Z, fall out there. And uh, they said, they're, sh they're short of, uh, gunners and other crewmen, crew members. So he says, you're going to radio school or gunnery school or whatever. And the first one was a radio school. And I said, so oh, that's not for me. So I managed to stay off that somehow, uh, kind of hiding. And then when the gunnery, uh, then mechanic school came up. Next time, I was again tr t supposed to go to uh, cadet training, and again the same thing happened. They needed more crew, crew people, so I ended up going to uh, mechanic school in uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. Was this still 1942 or was this 1943 by now? Oh, it had to be 43. So you. Where did you go next? From there I went to uh, gunnery school. Is that in, in Texas? It was in Harlingen, Texas. And then we graduated from there. I was sent to uh, Boise, no, Salt Lake City. And uh, they were assembling crews. And, and from there they sent me to Boise, Idaho. And two months later, I got my crew four officers and uh, five other enlisted men. Was that Gowan Field that you? Pardon? Was that Gowan Field? Gowan. Gowan. Yeah. Gowan okay. Field, uh-huh. So what did you do while you were waiting for the crew to assemble then? You? I was working on a flight line as a mechanic. Hmm. So you had um, six enlisted men and four officers then in right. your crew? Yes. And, and who was the commander of the field, of that I, field? It was uh, Colonel Killer Kane. He may have been uh, a general by that time, I don't remember, but we, we just knew him as Killer Kane. He was uh, one of the men that got uh, decorated for the first Ploiesti raid in uh, Romania. That was the one called Operation Tidal Wave, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. Yes, tidal wave. Yes. 
So when you got the crew together, then you uh, trained together as a crew, flying across the country and... Flying across the country, flying night missions, and uh, gunnery practice on a range from a plane, you know. Okay. And uh, after, I, I, can't, I can't remember exactly how many weeks or months that was, but uh, at, when that was over, they, we, they assembled all the crews that were in that particular uh, flight training thing. We got on a train, we had the band out there, you know, and, and uh, it made us feel pretty good about it. And then we went to Topeka, Kansas, and we picked up our plane and uh, orders. Of course, they were, we weren't supposed to open the orders till we got back in the air. And that's when we found out that uh, we were headed to Brazil to go to Italy, which, which I, I, I wanted to go that way rather than to England. I don't know. I just. So what was the uh, jump off point from the States to go to Brazil? Was that it was in Florida. Was that Palm Beach? Palm Beach, with Palm Beach. From there we flew to, uh, it was, I can't remember, Natal, Brazil. And, I, and then you jumped over the ocean to Africa? Yeah, we went from there to Dakar, then to Tunis, and then to Italy. Now you ran into some trouble between Dakar and Tunis, right? In Africa, flying. Well, we had several things happen. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the times, first of all, in Brazil, we had Bombay uh, air areas that were converted for carrying equipment. And uh, when we were in Brazil, just before we left, we bought a large stem of bananas for like <laughs> a dollar and a half. The reason I'm saying that because that'll come up later. We, we got into a real bad snowstorm over the desert, flying from Dakar to Tunis. You wouldn't believe that that would happen, and, would you? Uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, we were just thrown around in that uh, particular storm. We iced up and managed to get rid of that, and, and we ended up out over water. We were not even near, anywhere near uh, Tunis. And we saw this small island, just a small, all, all was on it was a, a fighter strip that was all pockmarked, but we had to make a landing. And we were there for four days and we lived off those bananas. <laughs> and unfortunately, everybody got a little dose of diarrhea <laughs> because that's all we ate. So the, so the bananas came in handy. <laughs> Now you were waiting for, the, was it the British that came by to? to yeah, our radio man got on the uh, radio and uh, finally got contact with an English uh, outfit that was uh, further down in Africa. And they uh, came back and got our pilot and they went back again and they, in a barge they brought up gasoline in uh, 50 gallon drums. Then uh, they had uh, some of the workers hand pump gasoline into the plane because we weren't we weren't uh, refueled in Dakar. We were supposed to get refueled in Tunis, so we were pretty low on gas. So uh, after that, we ended up going to Italy. So you flew from that island to Italy then? Yeah, it was like taking off from an aircraft carrier. It was a very short runway. In fact, we spent one one day filling in the potholes so that you know we have a better chance of making it. <laughs> it. Must have taken those guys a long time to hand pump all that gasoline. Oh yeah, it took most of the day. So then, what town did you land in Italy? Ma Mandoria. Yeah. That was our operating field. And what was your bomb group and squadron? We ended up in the 721st Squadron with a 450th Bomb Group. So then you, when you got to Italy, you flew your first mission 
in t uh, around June of 44, is that right? 14th, wasn't it? Fourth? Well, I, guess I just have June of 44 in my notes. Oh, okay, June of 44, okay, I thought uh, 14th. Yeah, that was it. In our first mission was uh, tail end Charlie, down at the bottom, and we went to Ploiesti. Oh boy. And we got hit by fighters, and, and uh, we lost quite a few planes. Out of your squadron? Yeah, and that's when my uh, navigator got killed on that mission. On the first mission? Yes. And then when was your last mission? My last mission was uh, to Germany. Ah, God, I, I, I can't remember. It was just the other side of the Brenner Pass. It was on Christmas Day. And that was it. For these, uh, for a typical mission, what kind of alt what altitude did you fly? From 22 to 26. <laughs> and wh which missions would you say were your toughest? You know, which targets were the toughest targets? Uh, Ploiesti, of course, was number one. Number two would be Vienna. Uh, Regensburg was another one. And Munich, of course. Why were these so tough? Was it the fighters or the? No, and the aircraft. They had tons of guns on all those places. So uh, it, actually, after about oh, six or eight missions, we no longer saw any fighters. We saw, we knew they were there, but uh, the red tails, with the P-51s kept them busy, they kept them off of us. That's the uh, the Tuskegee Airmen? The Tuskegee Airmen, yes. But you didn't know that, that at the time, did no. you? No, well, we did later on, but not if, for a long time, we didn't know who it was. We just knew that they were a new fighter group. And their base was kind of separated from yours? So. It was north of us. Now, you said that you flew 51 missions in 36 sorties. Yeah, well, yeah, they had a way of it, it, uh, difficult missions, long and, like I said, to Austria, uh, Vienna, or Ploesti, it was given double credit. You could fly, you could end up with 51, but no matter how it worked out, you had to have at least 36 sorties. So you couldn't, you couldn't fly up, you know, many doubles and, and end up with 24 mis uh, missions, you know, authorities, it wasn't allowed. <laughs> so the like to, the, the missions to Munich would be a double mission? A double. Vienna would be a double. Ploesti was a double. There may have been a few others that I don't, been a long time, I can't remember a lot of things, you know. Um, what, did Ploesti get easier the, the, the farther into the war that you got, or? Never got any easier, never. They had guns even mounted on railroad uh, uh, tracks that they would follow us out, you know, coming and going. Oh, geez. Mm. Now, you said your navigator was killed on a, the first mission. Did your crew suffer any more casualties? The co-pilot was wounded pretty seriously. He, he cut him open from one side to the other. Wow. Was that flak? Flak. It was, yeah. It, it just it kind of rolled around inside of his flak vest to keep it from, and it rolled around and just opened him right up. Jeez. So they patched him up and, and they sent him back to the States. Was that on the way out or the way back on that mission? Do you remember? When he got hit, over the mission, okay. over the over the target, yeah. Now, did your plane suffer uh, battle damage? Oh, yes, quite a few times. We never made it back. We had to land uh, some other airfield, uh, either for lack of fuel or problem, to, you know, with the engines or something, electrical problems. So they would patch it up at, at that field? Well, after we got back. Most of them, we, you know, they, they weren't that serious that we couldn't fly, but several times we had to leave the plane there. It was so junked up that uh, they just left it 
once at Corsica after a Toulon raid. Uh, we hit the sub pens. And, and another time, uh, just north of uh, Rome, we had the land. It was, actually, it was one of the uh, fighter fields we had the land. It's the closest we could get. And then, was that the was that the plane bottoms up that were no bottoms up we we had a lot of flag damage but nothing serious we always brought she always got us back <laughs> now in your notes you talked about a couple of times you had to um, drop your bombs through the bomb the bomb doors with the, they wouldn't open can you talk about that several yeah twice in fact uh, they would just freeze up or something. We couldn't break them open, so when we get over to the target, we just drop them right through the doors, and the doors would be swinging like it, and all the way back. Did that uh, cause problems for the plane to make it no, slow it down? No, just kept the guys in the back end cold. <laughs> <laughs> so was bottoms up a, a B-24H then, or a J? I, I can't recall. It was one or the other. But <laughs> Um, can you describe how you, because it did, it got cold even in Italy, right? And you had to heat your tents somehow? <clears throat> oh, we had, yeah, we had uh, rigged up a, a tank on top of the roof with the drip dripping into a 50 gallon drum with sand and bricks in there and we'd light it and the drip would keep keep the heat. The one end of the, I was at one end of the barracks, the other end of the barracks was cold. <laughs> it sounds like it'd be dangerous to, to do. Yeah, we used uh, we used 100 octane gas for everything, even for cooling off our beer. <laughs> <laughs> we, by throwing, burying the beer can in the sand and then throwing the gas and it evaporated fast and we just move it to another place. Pretty soon it got, it wasn't cold, but it was cool. <laughs> now as the flight engineer, did you have gunnery responsibilities too? Oh yeah, I had the, the top turret gun. That must have been pretty scary to be up there. I mean, can you describe what it was like? I mean, well, you mean in the turret? Yeah. Well, no, I, I, uh, it was just something that you, you had to do and you never gave it a thought. You know, you just climbed up in there and uh, that was it. Scan the skies, you know, looking for planes. Was there any, um, did you, was there any any aircraft that got close to you? I mean, do you remember a shell going off nearby or? How was that again? Did, what, did, you, did you see a shell nearby? I mean, when you were up in the turret that scared you? You know, when something, um, uh, any aircraft no, went off. You know, I, like I, I think I told you earlier that uh, to me, seeing all this happening was like being in a movie. I, I just, it, it never came off as something that was reality, you know. You see a plane blow up or something, and it just, you, you kind of took it for granted. You know, it, it wasn't you, so that was it. So where did you go after you'd finished your missions, after you had your points up? Where did they send you? I ended up going to uh, Chinook Field, Illinois for B-29 training. Where did, you, where did they send you first in Italy, though? Italy? Yeah, when, when you got done on your oh, way home. In Naples. Okay. In fact, I was the only member of the crew that got to fly home. I, I got there by truck to Naples. And they bedded us down in the, uh, like a hallway because there was no, no room for everybody in the rooms, you know. And in the middle of the night, somebody came by and says, hey, you want to fly home? I says, yeah. He says, get your crap together and be down here in 10 minutes. And he says, we're going, load the trucks, we're going you know, uh, to, to the airfield to fly down to Africa. That was it. And then what kind of a plane did you fly back from Africa? Uh, C-54, I believe it was called, four engine. Yeah, it's a big plane. Yeah, commercial type. So then you got home and you got a furlough and then you went to B-29 school? Right, I was there for six weeks. And 
I don't know how that all came about, but I ended up from there. They sent me to Langleyville, Virginia uh, as an engineer on a plane. Uh, we, were, we were doing uh, touch and go landings with uh, the green pilots. Was that B-24s? Yeah, B-24s. That was uh, right around when the Japanese sur surrendered. Do you remember anything about that or where you were? I'm trying, uh, March. When was, when was, I can't remember. August, when they, August. Of August. Yeah, about that time. I was there for quite a while. I can't, I can't remember how long. You don't remember any parties or anything? Or? No. No? No, we, no. I wasn't involved in any of those big just celebrations. I was, yeah, I was on the base. So what happened next? Did you had enough points and you... Yeah, you know, they called me in and said, you get, you've got enough points. He said, what do you want to do? You want to re-enlist or you want to go home? I said, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> <laughs> but they did try to talk you into staying in the Air Force. They tried, they tried to offer you oh, yeah, to Oh, yeah, they offered me. Yes, they said, you know, you want to know if I'm, which, which way I wanted to go. And I said, I'll go home. So when you left the military, what happened then? Well, yeah, I, I was out of a job, of course. <laughs> uh, I applied at American Airlines to work as a mechanic, because I had mechanic training. And the first thing they wanted to do was send me down to South America. And I said, God, I just got home. I, just, I don't want to do that. So I st got into uh, an apprenticeship program and it was a, unfortunately, it was an non-union shop, and the union uh, made it tough on them. And eventually, the company went out of business, and I was out without a job again. So I applied at a similar type of uh, place. It was a union, and they says, "Well, I already had my apprenticeship done." And they says, no, you're going to have to start over. We can't give you credit for all of that schooling. So I says, no, thank you. So I ended up going to uh, temporarily Ford Motor Company. I was going to try to get into their hydraulic pro program because the uh, B-24s were hydraulic, and I, I had a little experience. And. Uh, I got wind of, uh, I was getting a well, dollar nine an hour or something like that, and, and one of the kids, he says, my dad works for a photo engraving company, and he's making over three dollars an hour. Well, that lit up a few little light bulbs. And I took pages out of a news uh, telephone book, and I was working afternoons at Ford's, and every morning, from nine o'clock to one, I would call on different places and try to get a job. And of course, they all said, "You have an experience." I says, "No." And I did that for I think about two weeks. Finally, I said, "Ah, oh, I couldn't get a job." And I went to the union office, and he's uh, the photo engraving. He says, "You don't want to get in photo engraving. That's going out." is the new thing is offset printing, which is lithography. So I did the same thing with the phone books for lithographers. And after three weeks of calling all these on, personally on a, you know, streetcar, bus, you know, and then I'd have to come home, and get ready for work. The last day I said, I said, well, I can't go again. I said, I'm gonna make a phone call. So I called this place and asked, you know, if they needed, if I could get in the, a job there. He says, well, he says, uh, we, could, we could do you somebody. It was a new company, just a small shop. He says, uh, can you come in tomorrow for an interview? I says, I'll be there. So I show up and I, <laughs> I'm surprised I got the job because uh, one of the questions was, what makes you think you can learn this? 
I looked him in the eye and says, you learned it? I says, I know I can learn it. <laughs> uh, that just, later on I kind of wish I hadn't said that, but it worked out good. I got the job, worked my way up, apprenticeship. Eventually I was running a shop and uh, oh, after about, let's see, 12 or 14 years, I went out on, as a salesman, estimator. And uh, that was what I did the rest of my working days. Did your, your, do you think your training from the Air Force helped you in lithography? I mean, did you use any of that knowledge? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, if there's nothing else, I, I say, uh, the way I look at it, I think everybody should put a couple of years into the military because I'll tell you what, it did a world of good. It, you learn to you associate with people, get along with people, and you learn, you, you know, it's, it was a great experience. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd want to do it again, but I wouldn't, I'm never sorry that I ever did it, you know, it was worth every bit of it. Um, do you, where, where did you meet your wife? At a dance hall, Grand you know, Greystone Ballroom. And do you remember what year you got married about? 46, I think, 40, I don't know, 45, 40, 1946. And did you have any children? Yeah, I had two, two boys and a girl. And what were their names? Chris was the oldest one. Ronald was uh, the next one, and the last one was uh, my daughter, Sandra. And do you have any uh, great granddaughters or great grandsons? Yeah, I have uh, let's see, three granddaughters: L Lindsay, Carly, and Alana. And two of them are married, and one has a little boy and a girl. And the other one has just had a little girl about five months ago. Oh, wow. So that, that's the extent of the family. Are they all nearby so you get to see them? Or My son is, lives in Redford. He's about, I think he's about 10 miles from me. And my daughter was living in uh, South Lyon, she had just five weeks ago moved to Traverse City. In fact, I just spent a week up there um, about a week ago. I, first time I'd been up there with a uh, new home. Is that and like the oldest, my oldest son, Chris, he was killed in an uh, act car accident. Actually, he was a racer. He was racing a car and up Canada at Mosport, and uh, he got killed in an accident there. That's that was in 1981. Well, is, is your daughter move up to Traverse City to retire, or is that? She, she, she's retired. Okay. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. She's partially retired. She was self-employed. Okay. And in fact, she, uh, I got her started in the printing end of the business, and she started her little own advertising agency, and she still does it. Oh. She does most of it on the computer now. You know, and when I was in it, we didn't have computers; so we were just coming in. You know. Yeah. Now you said that you thought that um, everybody should serve in the military or, or some service. Anything else? Yeah that you'd like to say to people that are growing up today based on your experiences? And I, I just, I don't know, I think it just would do everybody a, a bit of good, you know. Keep them off the streets, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't have any more questions for you, Joe. I want to thank you for your time today. I enjoyed talking to you. No, you're welcome. I've been living my military life. <laughs> <laughs>